Good morning, everyone. Pastor Johnson coming to you live this Sunday. Uh, this Sunday, we are commemorating the Lutheran Reformation, giving thanks to God for the work of God through the Lutheran Reformers, both in the past and certainly uh, today, that the gospel still continues to go forth for the sake of the glory of God. Um, I am Pastor Johnson, and I am the associate pastor here at Zion Lutheran Church, also helping to serve out at Zion Lutheran, uh, Bethany Lutheran Church in Anawa. And that is where Pastor Jerdy is headed this morning for a confirmation service. And so today was a little bit busy. As you can tell, I'm a little bit behind the ball uh, with uh, a little bit longer service, a lot going on, uh, but it was a beautiful service all the same. Um, today we are diving back into our Sunday focus for Bible study, which is what is so good about being a Christian? What, what is... What, is, what are some of the things that mark the good Christian life? And the big theme for today is what makes what's, what's so good about being Christian is that we have a new family, uh, that through Christ in faith we have a new family. Um, and this new family that we are given is made possible by, <clears throat> by being united to Jesus Christ. That's what makes it all possible. We are united to Jesus Christ through, through baptism. And so we receive a brand new family, a family that um, is, is quite big. Um, it spans all ages, all generations, male and female, uh, slave and free, as Paul would say in Galatians. It spans all ge geographies, all ethnicities, all cultures. And so through Christ, we are given a, a, a brand new family, a big family, a family that we can barely even uh, begin to fathom. Uh, and this, I think, is very important because when it comes to family, families, generally speaking, uh, are, are about unification, being united for a common purpose. Um, and a family isn't always the, the best kind of metaphor for the church, but I think for our purposes it works because uh, families incorporate all sorts of different people. Uh, for example, when I, was, <clears throat> when I joined my wife's family through marriage, I then also received a few other brothers-in-law who came in from other families, right? And so then you've got all these different people coming together from outside, making one family unit. And, and this is kind of what the church is. The church is all about uh, bringing people into the fold of God, people who, who might not have been uh, friends otherwise, people who we might not have ever realized were people of the same confession of faith we are. And so God really surprised us by giving us this great new family, this great big family, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and having this unity in this family of God and the church is so important because, of course, as you all know, we live very much in a divided age, right? There are political divisions, um, there are divisions on certain, certain philosophies, how life ought to be lived, what, what makes the good life the good life. Uh, and certainly Christianity has a truth claim on that, saying the, the good life of the Christian is good because of thus and so. And that's what we're talking about here on Sunday mornings. Um, but of course, there's also divisions in the church about the global impact, uh, the human impact on the global environment. Is that a thing? Um, how the Constitution should be interpreted, right? There's all these things on the periphery that are going on in our lives and our culture. And so when we come to church, uh, a lot of that, a lot of those divisions, though they're still kind of there, are essentially erased because we, we become one in Christ. The, the, the main point about being a Christian is that we are one in Christ. God makes us one. All these different people from all these different places with all these different ideas, God makes us united to him in one body, in Christ. Now, of course, um, division is nothing new in the world. Uh, we know that the ancient Greeks and Romans were very much divided. European colonial powers from back in the 1700s and 1800s were very much divided. Uh, Native Americans here before the settlers came were very much divided, all competing for resources and, and so on and so forth. And so division is really what, in, in a sense, to be divided is, is what, mean, what it means to be human in, in, in secular terms. Uh, but to be Christian in spiritual terms is to be united. And so uh, that's what we really want to emphasize for today, that what's so good about being a Christian is that we, we have a new family. We have a, you, a new unification that comes through Christ, and we are given a brand new family that spans all ages, all generations, all ethnicities and cultures, and what a beautiful thing that is. Now, what unites us in the one true church? Uh, what unites us in the one true church, of course, is Christ. And how, is Christ, how does Christ come to us to, to make us a new family? 
Well, he comes to us in his word and sacraments. And so this is one of the things that the Lutheran reformers highlighted in Article chapter, uh, excuse me, in Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession, and they also will go on to develop in Article 8 of the Augsburg Confession. Uh, so let me read for you Article 7, which talks about what this new family is, how this new family comes to be. The Reformers write, Our churches teach that the one holy church is to remain forever. The church is the congregation of saints, in which the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are correctly administered. For the true unity of the church, it is enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. It is not necessary that human traditions, that is, rites or ceremonies instituted by men, should be the same everywhere. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And so what that is highlighting, Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession, is that we have this new family and this new family doesn't everyone doesn't have to dress the same in, in other words in this new family and so as long as the essentials are intact namely that the gospel on one hand is, is rightly preached and that the sacraments are properly administered there you have the church there is the family of god waiting there for you preparing to surround you and, and bring you into god's embrace um and so even though many changes happen in our lives through political parties and, and so on and so forth, uh, the, church, the church remains the same in Christ. But with that sameness, with that unity, there is a, uh, a fair amount of diversity. That There's great unity of diversity in the Christian church. And so this is why um, we just simply love the liturgy here at Zion because one of the great gifts of the liturgy is that there are so many different churches, so many different cultures that utilize the liturgy for their worship. And so we are celebrating in God's house, correctly hearing the word being preached and the sacraments being rightly administered. And so the liturgy really helps to unify us in that family life of the church. Now, of course, the liturgy is, is important and very important, a very important unifying factor for lots of different churches. Um, but there can be some variety in the liturgy. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, all churches have a liturgy. Um, all church, that is to say, all churches have a structure. There's always a structure to worship because God is a God of order, not a God of disorder. So there's always a structure to worship. Whether they call that a liturgy or not is besides the point. Um, but there always is a structure to worship that unifies the household of God of faith um, around God's word and around God's sacraments. And so if you want to find a true church, if you want to find a true family, then go to where the gospel is rightly being preached and the sacraments are rightly being administered. There you will find the true church. There you will find a church that is created in the image of God, not a church that is created in the image of man. And this is ultimately where we find this new family because again, in this church, we have all sorts of different people, old people and young people, people from all sorts of walks of life, those who are very wealthy, those who are struggling to get by, uh, those who work a nine to five job at the factory, those who work in marketing in the banks, those who are struggling to uh, put make ends meet and, and work at local restaurants and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, and so there's a great diversity in, in the church itself. Um, and we give thanks to God for that diversity because God calls people uh, from all walks of life. We saw that with the disciples, right? We see uh, Matthew, who was a tax collector, was no doubt probably a very wealthy man. He might have become very wealthy at the expense of others, uh, but he repented of his sin, became a member of the church, a disciple, and then went on the way of following our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have other apostles, for example, like um, Peter and Andrew and, and John's and John and James, who were probably living hand and mouth day to day. Um, they might have been... We, we're not quite sure how well off they were, um, but they probably were, were struggling to get by because if the fish weren't biting, then you weren't making any money. And so you have a great diversity in the church uh, in regards to wealth. And also, as, as we see in the early church, as the gospel expanded, one of the great beautiful things that happened were all these different cultures started becoming a part of the one true church. <clears throat> and of course, this became a cause of, of controversy for some churches. Because um, when you have Jews and Gentiles together coming together in one church, 
Uh, one of the big arguments is, is, is about food, right? Uh, and that's something that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians, um, where the Gentiles, they can eat bacon, they can eat you know, uh, pork chops and, and what, what have you, and mollusks and, and, and other things. Uh, but the Jewish Christians weren't quite, they weren't quite there. They, they, they still held tenaciously to those Old Testament laws about food and purity, food purity laws. And so there was a little bit of uh, friction in the early church when these cultures came together and collided. Um, yet even though these cultures were very, very different, God holds these cultures in tension um, in, in, a, in a beautiful unity that doesn't always look beautiful at the time. Um, it, it can be kind of messy at times, as we saw in the early church, um, as the church expanded into the northern regions of Europe, as the church expanded out into India and to Asia, um, and so on and so forth, that the, the church, this new family, um, had some growing pains because when, when not only when, when different cultures are coming together, are there going to be uh, cultural issues between the different cultures, um, but because sinners are coming together, <laughs> right? Uh, because sinners are coming together, um, there are invariably going to be issues because one sinner sees things this way and other sinner sees things that way. Uh, that's why the Lutheran reformers really focus in chapter 7, article 7 of the Augsburg Confession on, on this. This is what marks the church, that the gospel is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly administered. Because all those other cultural accoutrements are, while important, and we, we don't want to downplay anyone's culture because culture really gives us a sense of identity, um, but our overriding identity is that we are in Christ, that he is in us and we are in him. And that spans all cultures, all languages, all uh, political divisions. Uh, to be one in Christ uh, is, is something different. Um, and it looks different and it sounds different and it looks and sounds so different because all sorts of different people are coming together. Hence, uh, a brand new family, a big family, a family that can be, well, it can be kind of difficult to be in God's family from time to time with, with differing opinions. Um, but as Paul says, the hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need for you. Or the, the mouth say to the ear, I have no need for you, right? There, there's that importance of, of, of having a blessed unity in diversity. Now, there is there's a, a sense to which diversity can go too far. Um, not, I'm not saying that there, there aren't cultures that we don't want in the church. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but when there's a diversity of opinion in the church of, of how the church ought to be run or what the worship should look like. Uh, and so the, there, there are some things that we can negotiate on. Um, in the, during the Lutheran Reformation, there was a great talk, uh, a, kind of a great controversy about how we should regard vestments. Um, for example, some churches wanted to have vestments. You have to have vestments. If you don't have vestments, then you're not doing the liturgy right. Uh, and other churches were saying, no, we, we don't want to wear vestments because, because the Roman authorities at, in those days are making us, and therefore we are not going to wear vestments because they're telling us that we have to. Therefore, because they're telling us we have to, we're not going to do that. Um, and so again, uh, all those external things, while important, um, we, we must understand that the most important things about the church are what is taught and preached in the church and how the sacraments are rightly given. So those are the two important things that make this new family a new family that we can all gather around um, having no disagreements about because this is what the gospel is, right? As we heard from Romans chapter 3 this morning, uh, that the gospel is about Christ crucified for sinners, raised for our justification. Uh, that's what it means to be a Christian. Jesus dying for us, for our sin, for our death. Um, and because of that, because of his death, we are, um, through faith, given a new life. And that new life brings us into the church. And that is the gospel. If we have the gospel, we have the church. And also, if we have the sacraments rightly administered, we have the church too. Uh, this means that we don't try to make better what God clearly says uh, to how to give the sacraments. Um, you know, one of the one of the interesting things about um, this pandemic is how churches have tried to handle how the sacraments are rightly administered. Um, some churches are trying to do online, a kind of online communion, and, and that is, I think, very unbecoming of the sacrament because how do you, you really can't be sure this truly is what it is unless you are doing it in person. And so some churches, instead of trying to um, really jump the innovation fence and, and going to a territory that is really kind of uh, kind of hazy and, and not really helpful, 
Um, some churches have done daily services. This is something we've done at Zion, for example. Have daily services for less number of people. Um, I mean, after all, the church forever and a day had daily services where God's people could come to receive the word and the sacrament. And so as we think about what the church is to do to support this new family, uh, maybe the important thing for us to think about as church leaders and pastors is how we give out the gifts of Christ as more often than we have been. I mean, certainly we give thanks to God for the Sunday assembly, um, God's people coming together, uh, but we certainly know that there are people who are not quite ready to come back to church. Um, there's lots of churches open, uh, and for those who are open and doing it safely, thanks be to God. <clears throat> and for those who are preaching the gospel rightly and administering the sacraments properly, uh, even more thanks to God. Um, but this time of pandemic has really caused us to think about what is the church all about? Um, certainly we give thanks to God for all those wonderful people who uh, do fellowship events and with cookies and coffee and cake and everything. And, and that's all wonderful, uh, getting to know what the family is all about. Who are these family members in the church? But what, again, primarily brings us to the church um, is not so much one another, though we do give thanks to God for one another, for the family that we have in Christ. But what brings us to the church first and foremostly is the gospel. Christ crucified for our sins, raised for our justification. And the sacrament. Here is God pouring water over the head of a child, over a person, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that makes them a new member in the body of Christ, a new member of God's family. And we receive the body and blood of Christ given and shed for our sins. And so as long as you have those two things, the gospel and the sacraments, you have the church. Now, uh, whenever we have people gathering in the church, uh, like I said earlier, uh, you're, you're calling sinners to gather in the church. And so this is where Article 8 of the Augsburg Confession comes in, where it talks about what this new family looks like. Um, and so let me read for you Article 8 of the Augsburg Confession. Although the church properly is the congregation of saints and true believers, Nevertheless, since in this life many hypocrites and evil persons are mingled therewith, it is lawful to use the sacraments administered by evil men, according to the, to the saying of Christ, the scribes, the Pharisees, sit in Moses' seat. Both the sacraments and the word are effectual by reason of the institution and command of Christ, notwithstanding they be administered by evil men. And so what this article is getting at is that the, the, the the gathering of the believers um, through our own physical eyes is, is always going to be a mixed bag, right? We, we, we won't be able to distinguish who are the true believers from who are the false believers. Uh, we, we just can't see that with our own eyes. God knows who are his, who are his uh, but we, on the, other, on the other hand, cannot cast that judgment. Uh, we, we, there may be times where we'd like to, where we think we know that person is definitely not a believer. Uh, I've seen their life. I've heard what they said. I know what they do. Uh, they are not a Christian. Um, but we, we don't know that. And certainly you will know them by their fruits. Jesus does talk about that. Um, but for someone who is a false believer, who is just kind of going through the motions, um, ultimately only God can distinguish who truly is his son and daughter and who truly isn't. And so uh, in the church, we as pastors, we, we preach the gospel, we let it fly, and we, we let God take care of the rest uh, because God ultimately knows our hearts, and that's where we reserve judgment. Uh, another part of this um, article, uh, Article 8 of the Augsburg Confession, is that it lifts up the, the leaders in this new family. Um, so the leaders in this new family, of course, are the, the church, the, the pastors, or as Luther would say, the, the bishop, right? The, what is a pastor but a bishop of their own local church? Um, and, and one of the controversies during the Reformation time was, can you, if you receive the sacrament, for example, of the Lord's Supper um, from a person who is a wicked person, a denier of God, um, just a scab of a, you know, just, just not nice person. They, they just, they're a pastor, but you, you can't believe they are even a pastor, just how they live their life and how they order their life and how they treat other people. Um, but one of the things that the, the Lutheran reformers lift up is that even if this person who is a pastor is just a knave, a complete and total knave, that doesn't mean that what they do in the name of Jesus Christ, namely baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
and give the bread and wine of Holy Communion, the body and blood of Christ, uh, that does not denigrate the power and the efficacy, the, the strength, the, um, the, what makes the sacrament a sacrament. Um, that doesn't denigrate from that. And so you very well may have a pastor at a church who denies the Holy Trinity, uh, but as long as they baptize the child in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, using God's name in the proper way, that child is truly baptized. Because, again, the promise does not depend on the faithfulness of the pastor. Um, the promise depends on the faithfulness of God. And so it also goes with the sacrament of communion. Someone, a, a pastor may be up there presiding over the Lord's Supper, and they don't believe that this truly is the body and blood of Christ. Well, regardless of what they believe of the sacrament, as long as they say the proper words, the words of institution, in the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, and so on and so forth. As long as they say the proper words, um, what they believe personally doesn't matter. And therefore, those who receive the sacrament truly receive the sacrament. It really is the body and blood of Christ, even if they're receiving it from an unbelieving pastor who doesn't believe one word of the things that they are saying. Now, of course, we would hope and pray that a pastor who is up there leading God's people actually believe what they say, but we can't always assume that, sadly. Um, it is what it is, right? We live in a fallen world, and not only do sinful people come into God's church and we make them into a new family because God wants to make his people holy, also, also sometimes do unfaithful, uh, sinful pastors creep into the pastorate and so they, of course, we must hold them to account, to accountability, um, and get them out of there as, fast, as quickly as we can if we know that they don't believe what they are teaching. Um, but what they do for the sake of the kingdom in regards of the sacrament, um, those sacraments are still valid. So if you were, for example, baptized by someone who later on denies the faith, leaves the, pa the pastorate, uh, leaves the priesthood, whatever, uh, that doesn't make your baptism invalid. If you had uh, received for a long time the sacrament from a pastor and then you find out in retirement that that pastor goes on to deny everything about the, about the faith, um, that, did not make their, th that did not make the sacrament that they administered to you as an invalid. You truly received the body and blood of Christ irrespective of what they personally believed. Uh, and so this is how God puts guardrails around, around the family, um, providing, uh, providing the promises of God that, that work, that do what they say they do because, God's, because God says they're going to do what they're going to do. And so therefore they do what they do because that's how God works. God says something and it is so. Um, so again, uh, today we're talking about how, uh, what's so good about being a Christian that God gives us a new family. And, and yes, this new family um, can be a bit... Uh, can be a bit, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, this new family can be a little rougher on the edges, we could say, uh, and certainly who, who doesn't have growing edges? I mean, I, I know I certainly do. Um, but nevertheless, God does give us a new family in the church. And, and what a beautiful thing it is that we encounter all these people, as, as C.S. Lewis would say, we, we encounter all these different immortal souls, um, all these different people, from all sorts of walks of life that we wouldn't have normally encountered had we not been a part of the church, right? Um, because as, as human beings, we tend to be thinking like birds of a feather flock together. And so we, we stay each to our own. But the church prevents that from happening because, the, because through the, 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 the gospel rightly preached and through the sacraments rightly administered, God brings us together in the midst of all those divisions, in the midst of all those differences of opinion, in the midst of all of our different cultures and languages and so on and so forth. God brings his people together into a very beautiful uh, symphonic um, gathering of his people. And, and this is what we see, for example, in the book of Revelation, where Paul, excuse me, John, he, he hears something uh, and then he looks and he sees this great big multitude of all sorts of people from all sorts of cultures singing all sorts of languages for the sake of the glory of God. Uh, and what a beautiful image that is of the church. People who are black and brown and white and every other uh, pigmentation um, singing all sorts of songs in, in English and in French and in Arabic and in Indonesia and in Mandarin and in Korean and in, um, all sort, in Swahili. All these different languages, all these cultures um, singing, singing glories to God. And what we see in heaven is that that isn't erased, right? 
all the best of human culture and society is brought into the new creation. And just think how awesome that will be that you will finally be able to understand every single language in the kingdom to come of all these different people uh, that have been brought into the church from Africa, from South America, from Asia, from China, from Russia, from the Nordic countries, from, from all over the world, uh, that God brings us into this brand new family. And what a blessing it is. And again, what makes this family a new family? Uh, what makes this family a family united? It is united because primarily, of course, because of the gospel, because of Jesus Christ crucified for sinners, raised for our justification, and the sacraments being rightly given to his people, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so that is what's so good about being a Christian for today, uh, that God gives us a new family. And what a beautiful family it is, what a wonderful family it is, though we are not perfect this side of heaven, we nevertheless are considered God's saints his holy ones, those who have been sanctified by the blood and the righteousness of Jesus. And thanks be to God for his work in us and in you. And so thank you all for joining me this morning. I have to go get ready for our second service here at Zion. And so may God's peace be with you this day and always. Take care.